Welcome, everybody. Um, you're all here because of London Works, and you know what London Works is. London Works is a student competition on industrial land. We've had a look at the site yesterday and had an introduction uh, from Peabody, uh, who are co-organizers and sponsors of the student competition. Um, and today is about um, you know, why industrial land? Why, as designers, should we care about industrial land? Um, and uh, what's the state of industrial land in London? For those who don't know the Bow Arts Trust yet, it's an arts and education charity on a mission to support community renewal by delivering arts and creative services through financially sustainable social enterprise models. And what that means is, uh, well, I think Michael will explain it to you what that means, but um, what, and I think you manage 13 different studios at the moment throughout London, uh, on the rise, on the up, and, um, and you're also looking at live workspace, I think. I think it's interesting. And when I looked at your latest enterprise, what I thought in the docs, what I thought really interesting was just this thing that many of the examples I've seen so far that try and combine industrial spaces, making spaces with other um, uses, tend to put them um, kind of on top of it, of the industrial space, so keeping the industrial space or making space on the ground floor and then putting something, adding something. And then what you're doing is, is kind of slightly more subversive in the docs. It's kind of, I mean, it, it seems to be in response to uh, that thing that many ground floors are empty and as docs is a flop line, so you're just inserting something on the ground floor. So you're just uh, putting it on a new footing, maybe. And um, maybe I'm entirely wrong, but you can, um, Explain to us more. Yeah. Over to you, Mike. Inserting is a, a funny word. I think it's more about placing. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Michael. For those that don't know, Bow Arts have been around for over 20 years now. It's one of those businesses, I guess, that evolved organically out of opportunity in the city and a part of East London, Bow, obviously, that had a lot of empty buildings and one particular large space uh, on. Bow Road, which is kind of the flagship for the company, and that has over a hundred studios in there. It's a beautiful old chapel uh, and factory warehouse spaces, and we've also got a, a gallery as well. What Bow do is find affordable spaces through either um, buildings that are going to be demolished, and there's a meanwhile usage where we can get peppercorn rent and therefore offer affordable spaces out to artists, or so places like Bow Road, where we started having um, our business there a long time ago, and we've managed to broker relationships between the council and the landlord to kind of maintain the cultural aspect of that area that was um, historically there as well, uh, as is now. So over the last 20 or so years, Bow Arts have kind of been developing that model one thing that sort of draws me to the company is the fact that once the, you know, the rents are quite affordable, but at the same time, a percentage of the rent revenue goes back into local education, keeping arts in schools. And as we all know, that's something that's the first to go with any um, government cuts. So the fact that the artists pay towards getting those same artists employed in the schools to help increase the uh, cultural output and in a sense, hopefully create a new generation of young artists is incredibly important. Another aspect of the company is that each site pays for itself. So all money generated on the site goes back into the maintenance of the site. They're very kind of, they're, they're run in a very simple way. And it also it has an expectation for the artists to take on an element of custodianship as well, which I think is important um, in every neighborhood or building. So this is a collection of different studio spaces that we've got. Uh, this is Old Manor Park, um, which is a, a lovely old library heritage building that we went into a collaboration with Create to develop. Uh, the Rum Factory, the old News of the World in Wapping. Uh, Rebecca Brooks has got some things hidden in there, I'm sure. Um, this is a much better use of it. There's over 100 artists in there. Uh, Barking, we've just opened last year. These two spaces are Barking. And it's experimenting with a different kind of uh, use of space, where it's more open plan, more like an art school to a degree in these buildings. The design is also trying to keep it cost effective, not having self-contained spaces that require a lot of um, infrastructure 
to manage that, but also trying to create space that has you know, a free flow communal atmosphere. That works in some places, not others. So that's where uh, Mena Park is useful, because you've got your individual spaces. Uh, as we said, we're developing two new projects at the moment, and we're working with the GLA, Notting Hill Housing, and Peabody. So it's kind of an interesting transition, in a way, for Beaux Arts to kind of work in collaboration with partners with a long history of social housing and developing around um, the city. So this is the sort of project you just mentioned, where Notting Hill Housing have uh, had this piece of land in the Royal Albert Docks for a very long time. They let it out to Punchdrunk for a while to do Duchess Amalfi, and it's been used for, meanwhile, um, sort of cultural activation for some time now, since 2010, 2009, I think. Uh, the development has finally come through. It's um, you know, medium height, residential. But the thing that is the most striking, and, and also somewhat risky for Notting Hill, is to give, in a sense, Beaux Arts all the retail space across the whole scheme. And that provides, hopefully, a new kind of challenge to developers to kind of see culture and cultural industry as an important, valuable, generative um, element to place within what would normally be, well, it is, I guess, um, commercial space. So this is um, one side of the key. It's a big C. And we've pretty much got all the units around this whole area. Uh, we've set up a modern iteration of the community centre in here, which doubles as an artist studio. We have three month residencies. The brief is for the artists to kind of have an open studio where people can come in, engage, work with them, learn skills. Uh, we've also got a cafe, which is actually dis disguised as a cafe, but it's a conversation platform, really asking people what they want, um, how they want to use the space. Already we've got a local uh, yoga teacher running classes in the mezzanine. We've got a local comedian running pensioner comedy classes. It's kind of evolving. It's in its first month and a half now, and it's kind of interesting to kind of really offer something back to the people moving into this new, new community. Along these areas, we've got studios, and on the other side, it's all studios, and different kinds of shared workspace, but also more sort of private, um, larger spaces for sculptors and painters. So it's trying to really attract a, a demographic that is sort of the whole gamut of the cultural industry from theatre designers through to web designers through to painters and, and sculptors and more traditional practices. Uh, this, as I said, has been an interesting journey. Notting Hill uh, have been, you know, taken a, a big leap of faith in kind of working with us as partners. And, and it's been really interesting kind of trying to develop a shared language, in a sense, as to what kind of environment arts and the cultural sector can thrive in. And for for us, it's about longevity and about having a stake in that community for a long time. And that's something I'll talk about a bit longer in a minute with Peabody, which is um, really coming into fruition. So one thing that, as we all, I think, know, once you kind of get somewhere, it's good to stay. And once you have tenants in place and they know that it's safe and secure and they can afford to be there, they invest into the neighborhood. So that's something we're really trying to um, instill within our relationship with uh, this particular space. Uh, this, is a, this is a layout, really, of uh, the same scheme. So this is the community center I talked about, studios, and then these are all studios here. We're working with uh, the Greenwich Cub Development Agency here and in Thamesmead with Peabody as well. They're putting in, in a sense, um, a mirror of what we do, but with the food industry, finding young food businesses, that need to develop their business practice, their product. And what they do is they kind of um, nurture them for a period of years, get them out into market stalls, test their, their sort of audience base before jumping into owning a shop and taking a huge liability. So this is gonna be open once again for the community to come in from seven to seven each day, but it's also going to be a production space for food businesses, which will hopefully start populating some of these other um, shops up here in a couple of years' time. That's kind of the, the vision, that we're kind of building that capacity, which is hopefully you know, a, a good model going forwards. This is uh, sort of sections of our Reba Stage 4 report for Thamesmead, which is the other big scheme that I'm working on at the moment. This is in direct collaboration with the GLA and Peabody. And Beaux Arts put in 
to take on this centre in a sort of open bid, really. This is the Lakeside Centre, built in the 1960s, 1970s, early 1970s. Um, it's a pretty remarkable <coughs> building, really. It's a um, very 1970s-esque photograph here. People know it from uh, A Beautiful Thing, a film that came out in the 80s, I think, and also Clockwork Orange, of course. Uh, it's kind of nestled um, within quite an enormous amount of landscaping. When you look at it from the main residential section, it's kind of embedded into the landscape. So we are now into uh, the first week of refurbishment. We started to strip out yesterday of this building, and it was kind of a, it's quite an emotional thing, because you're taking out decades of layers. Um, of people adding and adding and adding, like, you know, suspended ceilings, um, uh, sort of bad <laughs> carpet, the likes. Um, and it's that thing of how do we preserve this place's cultural heritage, because it is, it is still a, a live space for a lot of people, but at the same time, how do we bring it forward into being useful again? Which is, uh, you know, a similar dilemma that we have with this new development. How do we make it relevant? And I guess for us, um, and for me personally, this project is, is quite inspiring and quite curious because whenever you walk around the local area, everyone has a memory or an experience of this particular building. So with that comes quite an enormous responsibility. As an arts um, organization, I think it's important that we Im embed and celebrate the arts, but I feel that we shouldn't kind of alienate people through um, making access difficult. So what we've decided to do is sort of work with the building in a multiple different ways. You've got three, it's quite a, it's quite a difficult image to read, but you've got the lake here, um, which is very busy with the boating club. You've got this front of the building, ground floor, first floor, and then the roof. What we're looking to do is, and this is uh, hopefully some better images from the back, the front in winter, and then both sides. Uh, the building was, I guess, a members club, a community centre, a boating club. It's been a church. It's been many different things over the last couple of decades. What we're looking to do is give the outside a facelift, celebrate its architectural kind of um, history, but at the same time make it feel alive again, open again, you know, make it a little bit more contemporary. We're working with um, Architecture 00 to develop that. But inside, it's going to be quite a radical change. This is the ground floor. And this is, in a sense, the, the kind of main entry point for, and, and, and in a sense, hopefully the most kind of accessible part of the whole space. So here we have the lake. There are these very generous kind of balconies on the ground and first floor. What we're looking to do is bring GCDA, once again, the people we're working with in Royal Albert Wharf, into turn this section into a production kitchen so it can nurture food businesses in the local area. And then this is going to be essentially the front room for the whole scheme, which is going to be a cafe area, open 7 in the morning to 7 in the evening, uh, 7 days a week. And that irregularity is obviously very important. Uh, the production kitchen will be designed to be quite open plan, so you can see it from here as you're walking in, you can also see it from the cafe, and the idea is that people feel that they can see the process and also hopefully get involved within working in that space. GCDA do a lot of um, NHS-based mental health, food growing initiatives, they do health walks, they, do, they establish lots of allotments, but they also do a lot of food training and, and teaching, so that porousness is very important to us. They'll be managing the cafe as well, and it'll be a platform for a lot of the businesses based here to provide food for the general public. Um, we'll also use this as one of three gallery spaces, where we'll have track lighting so we can show uh, local artists, but also artists within the scheme. So there's that sense of ongoing um, accessibility, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a light touch with this is a cultural art centre. This section here is going to be a nursery for 50 kids between two and five years old. And there's a bit of a, a, a gap in the market, and especially um, embedded within a really big green um, piece of infrastructure like the park and the lake. 
we've just appointed the YMCA to take this on, which um, was you know, quite a long process to make that decision. But in the end, we thought they could also deliver a lot of um, schemes that would join the water with the building through canoeing and boat provisions with, with the little guys, which is, which is really interesting. Uh, so once again, you know, all of this feels pretty open um, to people coming in and using the space. These sections here are going to be studios for businesses that need, say, sculptors, uh, that need ground floor access. And then this is the boating club. So really, there's a real mix of different businesses in this space. At the back, our, our idea is to have a sort of urban farm provision as well. So the nursery, the kitchen can all kind of use this back lot, in a sense, to kind of grow, to socialize, um, to teach and, and kind of harvest uh, about you know good food provisioning. Right. Yeah, 10 minutes off. All right, good. OK, and these are the studio spaces there. Um, two residential, one for residencies and one for a site custodian, a, a, a caretaker, and the roof, which we're looking at multiple ways to activate that space, green roofing, solar panels, um, and the likes. But that's going to be a key sort of landmark for the exchange, once again, looking back across to where the residentials are. But as I said, we've got a, um, you know, being there for a period of time is very important to us, and um, Peabody have given us a 30-year lease on that building, which is great. I feel like in the first 10 years we'll set up, the next 20 is when we'll do our real work. So, um, any questions? I'll start we'll do questions at the end, we'll sure. Thank you very much, Michael. The uh, next speaker is, is Kevin. Kevin, thanks very, very much for coming. Uh, from Sevels, um, director of Sevels Commercial Research Team, and which is specializing in industrial and logistics real estate. And um, you're going to talk about current market dynamics in London and some innovative solutions to enable industrial and logistics uses to coexist with other uses, such as residential and retail. There we go. Good. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Um, I work in the commercial research team for Savills. Um, my job is effectively collecting data on what's going on for industrial property across the UK and Europe, and then using that data to inform our, our clients. Now, the majority of our clients in this space are, are big pension funds, um, you know, the likes of Legal and General, the likes of Standard Life, who own swathes of, of the UK. And what they're looking to do is, is gain a return for, for their, their pension you know, people who invest in their pensions, you and me, um, effectively. It's almost like a, a glorified buy-to-let property almost, um, but it's in the commercial sector. Um, what's kind of going on in the mo at the moment is, is a, real, uh, a real interesting period of navel-gazing in terms of what's going on in, in industrial and logistics property. Um, it always used to be the, um, you know, the dirty cousin, you know, in terms of commercial real estate. Everyone likes a shiny shop. Everyone likes a, um, a shiny new office. Um, just a show of hands, has anyone never bought anything from Amazon? Not for three years. Not for three years. Okay. Has, has, anyone, has anyone never bought anything online? Okay. So, that's good to hear because what's going on effectively in the structural shift from people buying in store to people buying online is having a massive, massive impact in commercial property markets. And we as an industry, whether, you're, whether you own this property, whether you're a, a planner, whether you're um, a long-term investor, whether you're a short-term opportunity, opportunistic investor, whether, you know, whether you're an architect, a master planner, whatever it might be, What's going on in that space is, is, is going to have an impact on your day-to-day, your -day, basically. Um, um, right, let's see what our next slide is. Oh, that's just my contact details, if you need them afterwards. Um, this is, is effectively a slide I, I like. Um, this is the year, last year, that, that logistics and industrial property became front-page news. Um, I've been covering this sector for 11 years now basically doing what, I'm, you know, doing what I'm doing now, talking about warehouses for, for 11 years. I'm coming at this from a slightly bigger business type of, uh, type of angle uh, compared to the kind of worker 
um, maker artist space. Um, I'm coming at this from, from, the, from the slightly bigger logistics distribution onward movements of goods perspective. Because actually, if you think about what goes on in, uh, in the UK economy, for example, 65% um, of our economy is, is consumer spending, is us buying stuff that we don't necessarily need. If you think about this type of commercial real estate, 50% um, of the, the occupier demand in warehouse and industrial space is related to the, the retail market. And Amazon coming in and, and shaking all of that up is having a big impact as well. But you know, we ended up on the, the front page of the Telegraph talking about warehouses, you know, which, is, which is unheard of in, in property terms. You know, it was always you know, the back page of, of the property trade press, the back page of planning magazine. You know, now what's going on is, is the front page of the broadsheets. People are really, really interested in what's going on um, because it has now a material impact on their life. If you think about all of the online retail that goes on, it all requires um, real estate that goes behind it. Um, to give you an, an example, the, the Savills residential research team um, believe that we need to be building 300,000 new homes a year um, to meet the demand in, in the UK. 300,000 new homes. Well, also, think about it. 300,000 new homes is 300,000 new delivery addresses. It's 300,000 people, 300,000 homes to be served by, um, by retailers delivering. And to do that, they need some form of real estate. Now, the problem that you're finding at the moment, I don't want to steal Steve's thunder, but talking about the uh, Seagrove has done some fantastic work um, on the amount of industrial and employment land that has been lost um, in, in London. And, and we're already, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we've, we've lost as much as we plan to lose by 2030. Yeah. So, more than 10 years ahead of schedule, we've already lost um, 12 years' worth of land to, to other uses, not industrial and warehousing. So, we as a, as a collective have to come up with, with interesting ideas, innovative solutions for the two, um, for the two uses to coexist. And generally speaking, generally speaking, what we're talking about is, particularly in urban areas, is the onward movement of product from A to B. Whether that's from a retailer to your house, whether it's from a, um, a distributor to, a, to another commercial entity, we're talking, generally speaking, about the onward movement of product. Not necessarily the manufacturing um, and subsequent supply chain that goes with the manufacturing piece. Generally speaking, we're talking about getting stuff from A to B um, in the retail and manufacturing market. So, what we need to do, I'm going to stand here for a second, a um, couple of big headlines here. In terms of what went on last year, Brexit, um, the economic uncertainty that's going on with the, uh, you know, with the economy, all of that type of stuff. We had the best year of demand for warehousing and industrial property in the UK ever. 34, 35 million square feet of property transacted. That's a huge amount. Never before has there been that much amount of warehouse space transacted in the UK. Combined, we've got the lowest level of supply we've ever seen. So again, very little development going on in this sector. Very little development. And yet here, you've got Amazon accounting for almost a quarter, almost a quarter of all of the warehouse space taken last year. That's astonishing. You know, um, in the Christmas period, Amazon accounted for 40% of all online sales in the UK. Um, the problem with Amazon is they need a competitor. Um, they, um, they are going to take over the world, effectively. They're going to start doing prescriptions. They're going to start selling cars. They're going to start um, uh, selling, they're going to target the B2B market. So they're going to go into um, uh, competing with the likes of Travis Perkins, you know, uh, builders' yards. They're going to go into the, I mean, any market that hasn't been Amazonified within 10 years is, you know, well, it isn't a market worth being in. So now you've got Alibaba, the Chinese equivalent of Amazon, looking to enter the UK and European markets. They've taken two warehouses so far in the UK. Um, we believe they're going to take more. Do we think they're going to challenge Amazon in the, same, in the way that Amazon are, are going? We don't know. It remains to be seen. But what I do know is that all of this requires 
warehousing, put simply. So, you've got a problem though. Only 17% of normal, normal bricks and mortar retailers believe that their supply chains are in optimal condition. So, that means that pretty much every other retailer out there has got to reorganise their supply chain to meet the demands of, uh, of us as consumers. Then, look at this, John Lewis. John Lewis basically said, you know, their, their, turnovers are inc their turnover is increasing, um, and the reason that it's increasing is because they have got their supply chain in order. Um, we had a tour of a building that John Lewis um, operates out of Milton Keynes. Um, the building itself, the fabric of the building, uh, cost about 30 million pounds. Um, the machinery that they put inside that building was close to 150 million pounds worth of kit to service uh, what goes on around Black Friday and, and Christmas time. Within seven minutes of you making an order online, it was, it was in their supply chain heading to you in some way, shape or form. That requires a huge amount of, of kit, of automation, um, of, 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 of technology. You know, these buildings are effectively robots with the cladding, put simply. And this just goes back to my point about how, how these uses are going to need to interact in the future. This was um, some work that we did, talking about the amount of housing needed in, um, in, in London, amplified that across. But again, you can talk here, this was um, the Freight Transport Association released some stuff um, for the, before the London mayoral election. Again, because what we need to do collectively as an industry is get this land use um, further up the political agenda so people can actually, well, stuff can actually be delivered. Because effectively you're going to get gridlock otherwise. And then functional cities can't, can't operate. I don't propose that I'm going to go through these um, uh, slide by slide. Basically, um, I'll make sure you get a copy of the slides afterwards. Um, but what these all show, really, is that the vacancy rates, I've broken it down by areas. So this is Heathrow, for example. We've looked at other industrial areas in East London, in Park Royal. Um, what you can really see is that the, 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 the buildings that exist are of poor quality, generally speaking. Um, they're at the smaller size ranges, and, and the vacancy rates are generally falling. So when you have vacancy rates falling, you get rents rising. Um, when you have uh, buildings of a poorer quality um, available on the market, you get developers um, opportunistically trying to, to buy them and convert them to higher value uses, such as residential. So this is basically happening in every market that, that we cover. So Heathrow. Again, I'm not proposing to go through this, each one. Park Royal, another industrial uh, uh, hotbed of London. East London, same thing, same trends across the board. And actually, by the way, this isn't just London. This is Birmingham, this is Manchester, this is Leeds, this is Sheffield, this is pretty much anywhere with an urban uh, population. And again, the same true of, um, uh, in the bigger logistics space. You know, again, same here, vacancy rates falling, Rent rising. And I've talked about Amazon, but it's not just Amazon. Um, I said that Amazon accounted for a quarter of the floor space transacted last year. Well, actually, close to 90% uh, of, of the deals by deal count, which is how, how we talk about it in the property industry, um, you know, were, were companies not, not Amazon. But if you look at this, you know, all of these logos, um, you know, there's some projects that we've done uh, with Seagrove worth talking about. But look, you've got you've got breweries, you've got manufacturers, you've got parcel delivery companies, you've got uh, John Lewis, you've got Wasabi, you've got you know other all different types of, of operations, food companies. You know, this is all of the stuff that keeps London operational. You know, it's all of the stuff that keeps us fed. It keeps you know all of it is all in relation to to this type of property. Uh, I won't go through that one. Right, what are the solutions? So, we, um, we hosted an, um, a roundtable event uh, back in February. Um, I can send you the transcript of this if it's of interest to you uh, all. Um, but effectively, there is a, a school of thought now um, that, that actually you need to either intensify the existing industrial space. So is that going up? Is that going higher? 
is that doing what they do in Hong Kong? Um, Goodman, for example, which is a big logistics developer, have a 17-storey warehouse in Hong Kong. You know, is that something that we're going to see uh, in the UK and Europe? Are we going to, um, are we going to have to cohabit uh, side by side with, with uses that traditionally haven't cohabited? Are we going to have to look at going up in some way, shape or form and marrying up warehouse space, distribution space, leisure space, um, rent, uh, private rental accommodation? and a whole other myriad of uses. Because if, if you start mixing higher value uses, such as retail um, or residential, that's when these developments become financially viable. Because going back to my original point, is that they're generally speaking owned by, um, by a big pension fund or an investor who's trying to make you know, uh, sensible returns for their investors. So it's not all... Um, doable in terms, of, in terms of meeting the interests of all of those different stakeholders. So this is something um, in King's Cross, this is a Travis Perkins um, builder's yard, effectively, on the ground floor, um, and this is student accommodation above it. This exists, this is a really good example. Um, we're involved in a scheme um, uh, in Fulham, where you've got a cement making factory, effectively, um, with the, the residential above it. Um, this will be happening uh, in the next couple of years. Um, this is out in Hayes, um, which is again the old Nestle factory, which is a project with Zero Barrett, which we were we were working on as well, where you're seeing residential use and, and warehouse use side by side. Um, and I, I, I can't remember what that picture is, but it's a, a good example of, uh, of, of industrial behind behind uh, behind resi. Oh, and this is this is on the um, on the Caledonian Road. Um, so this is more in line with the, um, the, the first presentation where you're talking about residential use and kind of make a, um, a smaller, you know, 500,000, sorry, 500,000, 500 square feet to 1,000 square feet of, uh, of production space. Um, so there's ways and means for this all to work. There's a scheme in Paris where you have a, um, a residential development above a waste transfer station just on the banks of the Seine. You know, again... All of these different uses can coexist. The problem is um, perception and sentiment. You speak to people at property conferences. I was at uh, a property week event about a month ago, and somebody was like, "No, never work, never work." You know, how could you have a residential above a warehouse space? Too much traffic, too much noise. Well, there's a couple of points I'd say to that. Um, Tesco's have just ordered 5,000 electric vans. Um, that will negate noise issues um, in, in, a, in a pretty big way. Um, and if actually residential above a supermarket works perfectly well, people are prepared to do that. Residential above self-storage works perfectly well. Um, I can see no real reason. Um, personally, I'd like to get rid of the term industrial um, because it, it conjures up uh, perceptions about what's going on in these buildings. And as I say, the majority of stuff that is happening is the, the onward movement of goods. And actually, if people can get their head around that. Um, I can't see any reason why these uh, two uses can't coexist. And there we go. There are my conclusions. Um, really, you know, logistics, logistics is, makes modern life possible, put simply. And if you, if you can marry up a number of uses, you can keep things going uh, and, and actually deliver what, what, what people want when they want. Um, DPD now will deliver to wherever you're holding your iPhone. Um, you know that uh, that is a technologically brilliant, but again, it requi requires real estate. So there we go. I'll take questions at the end as well. Thank you very much. So I'm really glad that uh, the next speaker is actually from Nathan Wayne. Rima is a, is a business owner. Uh, Rima has a, a, a fine art background, and you've yeah. set up um, your business in um, uh, 2002, and you do uh, handmade um, uh, bespoke interiors yeah. for, for um, and you work with designers and architects um, for, for bespoke uh, internal fit-outs, and you've been working with artists and makers. Yeah, uh, you're, you're employed artists yeah. and makers. Yeah. And, and you've just relocated from uh, Bermondsey. Bermondsey. And yeah. we've had a chat 
And it just, I felt they were just uh, really interesting. I've done a really rubbish um, note, so I've done a great wallpaper for you. <laughs> Um, so just to reiterate a little bit about the last, the last speaker said, um, we were in Bermondsey for 10 years in a railway arch which a decade ago was the spaces that nobody wanted, super cheap, grubby, rats, all the above. Um, and that was a great space. Um, rents have risen, we got priced out. Um, it was very hard to find somewhere, a lot of industrial space has been knocked down, is waiting to be knocked down, so there's, there's very little availability. Um, we very luckily and happily ended up um, just off Nathan Way, sort of between the prison and the dump. Um, um, and it's, it's been a really fantastic and very positive move, um, partly because the internal space is very lovely. Um, but also it's really to do with our neighbours and that little community of businesses there. Um, so there's a lift manufacturer who has probably, I don't know, 15,000 square feet. Um, and then we're next door to some Ukrainians who have a CNC machine and they make fitted kitchens. There's a prop maker up the road, there's somebody producing screen printing inks. So there's all these sort of disparate businesses. Um, but within the sort of eight months we've been there, we've set up a kind of excellent bartering system. So I have exchanged um, glass for a kitchen. Uh, the lift manufacturers are making me an eight metre long bifold door in exchange for some glass. Uh, the screen print, the ink makers, we're just sort of negotiating what we can swap that they don't have and, and you know, that we need. Um, and I think that's one of the aspects of those industrial communities that people don't really see is that, I mean, whether you're an artist or someone who makes bloody great lifts, you, you know, it's, it's like any community, you get to know your neighbours and people do really help each other out. So I swap um, chocolate biscuits for the man with the forklift up the road who will just, you know, take eight tons off the back of a lorry. Um, and those things are, are really important um, because otherwise our day-to-day -day life would be much more difficult. And there's all sorts of small things that you can exchange with your neighbours. Um, and so for us, being just off Nathan Way has been you know, totally fantastic. Um, the other thing I suppose I would say is that having employed sort of artists and makers over the last 13 years, um, they are just leaving in their droves, um, you know, and that's really sad for somebody who grew up in London, whose cultural life has been nurtured by London. Um, and I think that a bit like Michael was talking about, there's got to be some new models for how people can exist, artists, makers, whoever, uh, dancers can, you know, exist within a community and actually give something back to the community. I mean, in our own small way, we have this brilliant little network of the people that are our neighbours. Um, and as Michael was saying, the idea is that we stay put. You know, we put a lot of energy into our environment and our neighbours. And if we, if our rents go up in five years, we'll, you know, we'll be gone and Amazon will move in. And, um, and we'll be in Essex, which for us is not really viable. Um, the other thing, talking to you earlier on, was just about things like uh, some of the logistical difficulties of moving from central London sort of to sort of Plumstead, East, West Thamesmead, um, has been things like transport and food. Um, so we've come up with some quite good solutions for that. You know, we have a car share. We do the cycle to work scheme for people that work for us. Um, we have a Sainsbury's delivery of food every week. We all cook together. We swap the kitchen with our neighbours, so we've got kitchens so that we can cook. Um, and all those things just make it possible to be there and work because there's literally nothing there. Uh, well, there's a drive through McDonald's, but you know, that's, I don't think any of us want to eat there every day. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just one facet of what I think everyone is here is to, sort of talking about today, the reality of existing on those estates and actually how, how positive an environment they can be, much as they don't, you know, they just don't look very glamorous. There's quite a lot of detail there in terms of relationships. Um, so now, just because you're in time, and you're the only one in time, can I break my own rule? <laughs> Yes. And just ask one question, sure. quickly, uh, just following on from the chat we had on yeah. Is, uh, you know, you're kind of the poster child of, of Nathan White. You know, yeah. you're exciting, you're young yeah. people, you're kind of good looking, you bring, uh, you offer things to the community, uh, you, you um, make beautiful things. And does that concern you as somebody who was kind of um, forced out of your previous home in Bermondsey? Just because, yeah, but we talked about industrial gentrification right? yeah. and this kind of that there's. And I'll just, yeah, you know, how do you feel about that? Um, I wouldn't want there to be a street of artists. That, I think, would not be very exciting at all. Um, I think it's great that there's, you know, 10 hairy blokes up the road who build lifts, and I think the mixture of businesses there. Is is really really positive. Um, partly because they've just got equipment I haven't got, and I've got things they haven't got, and just that kind of cross fertilisation of things. So the other day, um, a guy from the lift manufacturers came to talk to me about some weird mechanical part, which oddly he couldn't find a solution for. And I said, well, you know, why don't you just do this? And I'm not a mechanical engineer, but somehow he just thought that. I don't, I don't know why, but I did actually have a solution for it. Um, and I think a street full of artists, it would, you know, it would, I, I think it would be sad if, if, so for example, the lift manufacturers are up for a lift rent review and, and they possibly can't afford to stay, so they're going to go. And probably what would be interesting from a landlord's perspective is more people like us. Um, I don't think, from my perspective, that would be the most interesting outcome. Um, in Bermondsey, when we were first there, there was a baker, there was Neil's Yard Dairy, there was all sorts of people, there's a guy fixing motorbikes. That mix of people was great. Um, and then slowly, slowly, it became really food producers and breweries, and we were just the sort of grubby people on the street. And, it, you know, the kind of, we were sort of rubbing up against those people in. And I think they, yeah, we just weren't such a good fit anymore. Um, even though the block of flats across the road, which was, you know, very close, we never really had a problem with that sort of proximity. Um, I guess because we're kind of classed as light industrial. Um, so actually that, and people walking past, you know, would always sort of come in and say, what are you doing? And kids would wander in and we quite enjoyed that. And I think that is, that's just completely stopped in Bermondsey. Um, it is just brewery mile, and I think that kind of cross fertilisation of people just coming in. So the the baker that used to be up the road had this giant wooden paddle that kept breaking. So he would just come to us every six months, and we'd fix it for him, and he'd give us bread. And just all of that went. Um, so I think that that yeah, it was diminished. Um, but you know, on the other hand, rail, tra rail track are now making a lot more money. So yeah, I think that's it. Me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you. Uh, next is Alex. Alex is um, design <coughs> officer. I don't know. Project officer. Project officer. Uh, lives here at the Greater London Authority. The Greater London Authority is responsible for producing the London Plan. The London Plan is kind of the integrated uh, planning tool to um, um, control or affect change in London. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Or, sure. or that's yeah. the intention. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, more the intention sometimes than the reality, I would say. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, Alex is um, interested, of course, in the topic of industrial space, and I'll bring up his presentation. So. Uh, Thanks, Mark. And it's probably worth mentioning that I work in the regeneration team rather than the planning team. So you can ask me complex questions about the London plan. I'll do my best to try and answer them, but I'm, I won't promise that I can I can necessarily do that. Um, 
So, uh, Mark sort of asked me to talk about some work we've done in Park Royal on the Park Royal Atlas. Um, and so, um, I'm, I'm not actually going to talk about the Park Royal Atlas, but I am going to talk about what we do in the regeneration team in terms of the type of work that the Park Royal Atlas is like. Um, the particular example I use actually is Old Kent Road. Um, it's a shame that Jane wasn't here today, but it's um, very much worth taking a look at some of the work she's done and the work that CAS students have done as well. Um, so, um, what I won't do is talk in great detail about what we found in the Old Kent Road. I think there are better ways of doing that, like reading the actual study. And what I want to try and get at, and get at with you guys as well a little bit, is thinking about question, like why we do these studies, and what is it that we're trying to get out of them, and what is it that we're trying to unearth in terms of value. And it's those kind of questions that I think would be quite interesting for you to grapple with in terms of your proposal that you're going to be putting forward. So I think um, it's about what the value of industry in the city is and how that relates to different actors in the city um, and how that might play out in a proposal for physical change. Um, so as a brief introduction, we do these audits where we go around like my colleague Rob here up in, uh, up in Enfield. Um, and it's this kind of slow, very, uh, I'd say almost kind of pedantic process um, of mapping just the existing, what's there. Um, and that's a map that I produced in the projunction, mapping the 264 railway arches that you have there and the kind of huge number of uses that you have tucked away in those kinds of spaces. Um, and it's door knocking and it's just um, talking and um, taking photographs and interviewing and really kind of. Um, just finding out what people are doing there. Um, and all of that is translated into data and evidence that we try and then to uh, use as evidence as part of the planning process and planning for change. Um, so this is, for instance, a map that was produced um, at the Old Kent Road, and you can start to see the kind of really dense sort of layers of different industrial uses that you get, uh, like down here, which is one of my favorite bits of London, down in Patcham Road. Um, but bigger, sort of large uses as well, that's actually a Tesco, but um, there's a whole range of different things there from, from kind of from the high street through to industrial use of the railway arches that you can see up in the top right. And uh, that gets done into map, uh, date, uh, sorry, uh, graphs, I should say, um, looking at the various sectors and mapping that by doing graphs on the number of businesses, floor space, number of jobs per sector, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then case studies as well of the various businesses that we find, like Thompson and Son in the Old Kent Road, who are hydraulic repairers. Um, they're lifting here a, uh, a piston that was salvaged from a sunken World War, uh, World War I, I should say, sorry, battleship back in the 1920s. And this is them in 2015, 2016, I think, um, bringing it back into use. I just sat in their, in their site for almost. Uh, but that is 80 years without being used. Uh, another one here, Capital Chrome, that's him chroming up, or polishing up, I should say, uh, a bit of a Ferrari fender, I think. Um, not that you know it. So, um, what does the, how does all that relate to what you guys are going to be potentially doing? Um, I guess it's, it's interesting in some ways because what we were doing there is, is, is mapping the existing, showing its value in some sense. Uh, and yours is obviously a more propositional proposal. It's, it's kind of presenting options for change in some ways. Um, but nevertheless, I don't think this is an excuse for you not delving into some of the questions that we are thinking about when we're trying to figure out what is the value of this space, what, what value does it bring to a local economy or the London-wide economy. Um, and what I'd like you to see people avoid doing is jumping to the kind of simplistic conclusion that um, uh, just because it's there, it has the greatest value, or the kind of um, the mirrored sin of that one, which is um, equally egregious in some way, which is the, um, it has no value at all. Um, there is something in the middle there, and, and it's, I think, in some ways, your job, in some ways, to start to think about those questions and think about how that relates to your particular proposal. Um, so, Defining value uh, in this sense. Um, I should apologize, I drew this diagram after the Brexit vote and I realized I'd left off Europe or the world. <laughs> so, so the world ends at the UK, which um, I, I didn't have time to correct it yesterday, but actually quite, it's quite, quite telling probably at the moment. Um, so um, obviously value can be considered at different scales. Um, you can be thinking of the local scale, or the sub-region, or London-wide. 
Um, and I think as sort of architects and urbanists, um, you sort of start to think about that in terms of geographies. Um, so, yeah, I think probably the easiest way is to sort of actually give a tangible example. So say the waste trade, which is obviously has a huge value for London. It keeps London working, you know, uh, none, no building, no office building, no, you know, no household would work without the waste trade, essentially. Um, its value at a sort of regional and London level is, is totally undeniable. Um, at a local level, um, <laughs> it's not necessarily the use you want to be next to. Um, and in terms of the skills and kind of uh, the, the kind of types of jobs it provides, it's not necessarily the highest skill. Um, and to give another example, this is uh, obviously been talking about it a lot, but um, logistics here also up in Enfield actually. Um, this is a large shed being built for um, for someone, and it's you know likely to be taken on by uh, someone like DHL or Yodel, these types of uses. Um, and again, at uh, a London-wide level, the, the value and the kind of the, the sub-regional level actually, the, the value of this is, is is really again undeniable. It delivers packages, it delivers all the things we need. Um, yet for Enfield, um, Enfield Council is sick of logistics. They do not want any more logistics. Uh, at all. Occasional logistics is fine, but they are, you know, the, the, the issue is, uh, is around traffic that it generates and the strain that that places on the road infrastructure. Um, and it was very interesting to hear these places described as um, robots with, uh, with, a, with an outer cladding in a way. Um, the kind of the, the job security that comes with these places over, say, the next 30 years is, is far from definite. You know, the, the, the fact that um, a large shed in Enfield might employ 2,000 people at the moment. Um, does not mean that there will be 2,000 people working there in 20 years' time. And of course, then actually, uh, benefits and disadvantages can also play out at the same scale. So the MOT garage, uh, I think actually that's a, probably not very clear, but that's a large breakers yard in Loughborough Junction. And then a whole row of MOT garages in the, in the railway options there. Um, of course, that provides a, a really vital local service, it provides local employment, which is great. But it also has a downside in terms of pollution and the kind of the visual, well, the, the, the place amenity that, uh, that is created by this. I think Damien Hurst used to have a studio somewhere along here, so, so I'm told. Um, and now on the Orchid Road. Um, so you can start to think also about in terms of quantity of employment. So some places employ lots and lots of people, and that's obviously that's got a value for, for a local area and for a local economy. Um, but actually, I think it's more useful to think about density of employment. Uh, so uh, that there are jobs generated per square meter, in essence, and some some uses provide denser forms of employment than other. Um, and again, to make this try and make this a bit tangible, uh, large modern warehouses are space hungry um, to the point where uh, there's actually many of the contemporary sheds uh, have more yard space than they have actual building, uh, and this is largely in order to incorporate uh, the needs of sort of HGV access and things like that. Um, so obviously, in some of those some of those places, not all necessarily, um, employment densities are actually quite can be quite low. Uh, and you compare this to the sort of dense grain that you find in places like the Old Kent Road. This is dice becker who cut and cut marble and stone, and also happened to produce most of London's terrazzo, um, which is sort of polished concrete. Now. Um, the kind of density of employment you find in these areas is is often much much higher. So when you compare, say, uh, Hatcham Road here in the Old Kent Road, and it's kind of dense agglomerations of different layers of development, uh, you have an employment density that is almost double to the more modern warehouses that, built, that are built in the Old Kent Road, almost, I think, almost double. And then there's the quality of employment, which comes down to, in some ways, to that, that tension about, um, say, logistics, I think, is, a, is an interesting one in many ways. It's clearly absolutely crucial, um, yet, the kind of quality of employment that you find on that site and the, the security of that employment is not necessarily as high as you would find it in other forms of work. Uh, and that's certainly, I think, going to play out over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, this is a uh, Tesco.com center up in Enfield, which we did some work with, uh, with Oliver when we made that. Um, I mean, so you can, uh, it's really weird. It looks like a, it just looks like an ordinary Tesco. And then they just employ these people to like run around and, Pick stuff up and stick it in a, in a box, um, and that employs 2,000 people at the moment. Um, but whether that will continue to employ 2,000 people is questionable. 
given that you know you have a warehouse that continues for another I don't know at least 10 meters up above that um, one imagines that there is some some thought there among the people who designed it that there might be a moment when um, other forms of lifting and delivering might be thought of and it might might not necessarily include humans in that way but it generates other other possibilities of sort of high high paid well paid managerial jobs as well in terms of um, managing those processes and that's just by contrast actually sorry so this is also an Enfield where Siemens have a have a, a, a relatively small warehouse where they employ 80 engineers essentially to maintain London's traffic lights or London's traffic lights in the northeast area so again just by contrast in terms of that sort of um, quality of employment alongside quantity and density and then the value of particular types of spaces which I guess I sort of touched on again uh, thinking about the fact that actually many of the most interesting uses are I think found between the prison and, and, and the, the dump essentially that's you know definitely the case in the old Kent Road where, we, where I've spent many many hours figuring, kind of figuring out which uses are just here, these are the guys who make all the lighting displays for Carnaby, uh, Carnaby Street. Uh, beyond that is a sculptor making animatronic <coughs> metal walking sculptures. Beyond that is Flux Metal, who made a flaming bat symbol for the Batman premiere. Beyond that is Purpose Powder Coating, who did all the powder coating for the BT Tower and worked with Flux Metal, who worked with Thompson Sun. So you start to get these kind of dense, intricate networks. And actually, the value of these types of spaces might also be kind of registered in terms of. Uh, the kind of value of the types of people that can find employment here. Um, this is SME friendly space, this is London's affordable workspace and it will not be reprovided necessarily um, through new waves of development in terms of reprovided that level of affordability. Um, and so there is a value in that and uh, I think it's worth considering that when one is proposing change. So uh, very quickly thinking about intensification and mix and I think, I guess I'm keen that there's a distinction drawn in some ways between intensification and mix. So intensification for me is the uh, intensification of industrial uses with other industrial uses. It's not about the introduction of residential. Mix is where industry and residential get mixed together. And I think in order to accommodate London's need for industrial land, you're going to need both. Um, but I would also stress high levels of caution about mix being seen as the solution to doing that. Mix has the potential to quite fundamentally undermine parts of London's industrial economy by starting to introduce residential uses next to other uses. And if that happens in an unplanned way, uh, what you'll end up with is um, basically a sort of a clash between those residential uses and the, the industry it sits next to. Um, so it does take very careful management. Um, Mark just asked me to talk very quickly about the industrial intensification primer. It is online. Um, I'm just going to flip through some slides very quickly. Um, I think this one is actually really great, this example of intensification, which is like the simplest form of intensification. It's taking an existing warehouse, potentially, uh, and saying, well, one business may only need a small, you know, a small part of that, but you know, for historic reasons, it's rented out the entire space. And actually, intensification could be as simple as a sublease and a line of tape saying, this is your space, this is our space, we will share the kitchen, or whatever. Um, it could be building a mezzanine, it could be introducing better storage space or just rationalizing yard space and some of that. I think that's, that's a really valuable form of intensification, actually. Um, it could be tagging smaller units onto the sides of larger units, or, for instance, pushing the boundary of uh, the of sheds up right up to the property boundary. Uh, building upwards as well might be another way of doing that. Um, so, for instance, here, pushing out onto um, those scrappy grass verges that you see all over industrial uh, estates around the country, or that sort of that pointless bit of landscaping that you get in front of a bit of industry, which I, I've never figured out what, what, what it achieves, because it's, it's certainly not achieving any sort of genuine green space use. It's never used by anyone, and, it's, uh, and it has uh, little to no biodiversity value. So why not, why not push, push the shares up the street? level or tag small units onto it and stick the fire exit on the side. Uh, all this stacking, of course, uh, and there are people in the room here who are more qualified than I am to speak about this. Um, 
there's large logistics stacking as well, but I think you can also look at stacking smaller units as well. Uh, and that's something that has happened historically. It's happened now happening again in Germany and places like that. Um, and there are examples in the industrial intensification primer that you can take a look through. And then there's mix. And the only thing I would say about mix is that there are simple versions of mix and there are more difficult versions of mix. And that's the simpler version of mix, which is thinking about mix on a site basis. So putting a warehouse next to residential. Um, but you could also then start to look at thinking about incorporating uh, industrial uses into or as part of uh, a residential block as well. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Steve uh, from Segro. Segro are um, co-sponsors of the of the competition, and Segro are uh, one of the uh, biggest providers of industrial space. So uh, providers, managers. And not just in the UK, but also in Europe, I think. It's a big, big yeah. company. Yeah. And, um, and you've, been, um, you've been around in the industrial property industry. And um, you've been working at an industrial rates, which I've looked up and it seems to mean Real Estate Investment Trust, Brixton. Yeah. And I've uh, recently moved to um, Segro, where you are uh, responsible for leasing, pre-leasing, and asset management in London. Right. Bring up your presentation. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> so really, yeah, um, a lot of what I was going to say um, has kind of been covered a little bit by um, Kevin, who we do work with. Um, and actually, interesting, some of the things that, um, that Alex has just mentioned there um, relate to Seagrow as well. So <coughs> the um, industrial development that was kind of three quarters finished in Enfield was one of ours um, and uh, <laughs> that's absolutely fine it's been a, it's been a good one so um, and really what I do is the um, is the leasing so it is a big part of what I do and what you see on here is actually you know, speaking to these tenants making these deals happen finding who they are what they want and agreeing those terms as Kevin said you know I'm sorry I'm slightly adapting my presentation because I'm trying to really sort of avoid just rep repetition, but um, you know, as Kevin said, you know, we've had a really good time of it recently because um, you know, vacancy rates are almost at a historic low, supply is limited, demand's high. So you know, this is kind of you probably think this job sort of falling off a log stuff. Um, you know, we've undoubtedly had a good time of it, but um, you know, this kind of concept isn't isn't new. We've you know, industrials have been around for a long time. It's seen many transitions before from a loss of manufacturing to that kind of um, providing services and consumable goods. Um, and it's not always been kind of really you know, this situation where we're worried about the supply and demand imbalance. You know, for example in 2009 when uh, the bottom fell out of the world we had a, a vacancy rate of 21%. So, you know, that's not that long ago, really. Let's put that into sort of context. And now we're talking around sort of 5% in London. So, um, you know, this is a kind of a real good time at the moment for all the reasons that we've heard so far of where that demand is coming from. Not just e-commerce, but, you know, there are other, other providers around, you know, other users around as well. So particularly food, for example, is a, is a massive sector, particularly in Park Royal, you might have heard of it called the bread basket of of London, so a lot of food consumed and made in London comes through Park Royal. Uh, we do still have an element of manufacturing. We've got um, we did a deal about 18 months ago with Brompton Bikes, um, one of our um, West London properties in Greenford for 100,000 square feet. We'll actually make the bikes um, because it's a skilled skilled labour force they're looking for. Uh, it's not really that um, kind of easy just to um, to pick up. And I think also, sorry, before I kind of move on to it. The other thing as well that we talk about, and when I look at intensification, and we'll talk about that, is these aren't necessarily something that we're responding to occupiers' needs or what they want, because that's kind of pretty obvious. And Alex has touched on it. What they want is big yards, because they've got uh, big logistics vehicles coming in, because they've got parking for people that work there, and because they potentially want to store some stuff externally. You know, that's kind of easy. I can kind of draw you now roughly what occupiers are looking for on the whole in urban logistics buildings in London is 45% density. So it's nice big yards, high buildings, kind of 10% office content. That's great, but that doesn't marry up with the loss of industrial land, how we actually keep London working, 
intensify the uses um, and really kind of make the most of it for, for the whole of London, really. Um, okay. But yeah, a little bit about Seagrove. So, um, as Mark kindly introduced there, um, we're a real estate investment trust, so it's a FTSE 100 company. Um, so you can go out and buy shares, well, probably not by the time we leave, but be tomorrow, um, in Seagrove if you wanted to, and you would get returns through, the, through dividends. So really, we're looking to get the best returns for our investors. Um, we have a six billion pound portfolio across Europe. The kind of things we own generally fall roughly into three sort of categories. You've got big box warehouses, so they are over 100,000 square feet. In the UK, you might find them in the Midlands, Milton Keynes, places like that. Um, it's inventory storage, so it's regional, national, um, perhaps international uh, logistics. So it is going to be the likes of Amazon, the big retailers, kind of the first port of where this stuff comes in. Um, and as you can imagine, the likes of Midlands is cheaper than the urban areas. The urban areas, what we call sort of urban logistics or urban warehouses, they're going to be generally sub 100,000 square feet. Sorry, I'm still talking square feet just because it's still used kind of very much in the market. So you can kind of roughly work out the, uh, do the simple maths. Um, so urban logistics buildings are kind of going to be serving that last mile. So it's probably the last building this is going to come into. And as you'd imagine, that has to be in urban areas near to the end users. So home delivery, shops, offices, um, restaurants, that sort of thing. So, um, so for example, I can put up some occupiers there. I can say, you know, we've done deals with the likes of Ocado, John Lewis, so if you order a safe online at John Lewis, it will come into one of our warehouses at Origin and then go to your, to your house. Uh, Cardo is going to be your online grocery shopping. Um, mash purveyors are providing the top London restaurants with fruit and veg and things like that. Again, they want to be close to that end user. Uh, and we also got um, Wasabi there who are you know, manufacturing the um, food and supplying the shops. So again, they want to be close to central London. So it gives you an idea of who's, who's actually taking these buildings um, we're providing. And the last is the um, kind of higher value uses, so car showrooms, tray counters, things like that. So it might be a Travis Perkins, Edmonton Electrical, so if someone's coming to do a job in your house, an extension, they want to go and pick up their bits before they come and do your job. They want to go somewhere local, so if you live in Enfield, they want to go to um, Advent Business Park, which we built in Edmonton, go and pick up the tiles from Nichols and Clark, and then come and do your bathroom. They don't want to go to Luton for the tiles, drive back into Edmonton, and then go and go home again. So. Yeah, they're the sort of higher leases and then you'll get higher rents for them because they're generally smaller and they have to be in that location. Um, so again, this just gives you a split of um, Seagrove's portfolio for say £6 billion in value uh, across Europe, Northern, um, Central uh, Europe, London, 37% actually makes up a pretty big element of our business. We've got 12.5 million square feet um, in London across 55 estates and these are your real kind of classic key industrial locations so Park Royal Heathrow I've touched on you know real you know the most expensive industrial areas in London brilliant M4 A40 these roads are great Enfield <laughs> where they're sick of logistics <laughs> this is a little bit of a worry but um, we, do, we do have um, you know, some big holdings there some new developments we've got coming through with um, we've just put a pay application in for <laughs> Three um, logistics buildings in Lee Park in Enfield. Um, but yeah, this is really great for us. It's, it's, yeah, it's classic industrial areas, but uh, yeah, you can see the role this plays in North Circular. People living around here, central London, offices, shops to be served. Um, and East London, a growing market. So um, I'll talk more about that in the future, but you know, you're going to see a big population growth out here, and they're all going to need goods, they're all going to need services, they're all going to want you know, stuff they buy online delivered to their home the next day. Because, you know, and I guess, and this is a little bit of repetition here, but um, London is a huge consumer market and things are really, really changing and we're just you know, really noticing it. So um, online retail is playing a massive, massive element. 20%, um, I think, is the current, you probably hear different statistics, of all retail um, is done online. I, I don't actually think that's that much. I think we can all see that that's going to absolutely um, absolutely rocket and like I say this kind of delivery last mile delivery thing isn't necessarily a new concept but what is new is the expectation levels that 
you can go on your phone, order something, and you just kind of wait the next day, expect it the next day, or maybe even the same day. So, you know, how do you get? How are you going to get that there that quickly? Well, you're going to have to have your distribution, your last mile distribution, pretty close to wherever you're wherever you're sending it. So these are really kind of the, the challenges that the, the sector faces. So kind of, you know, what are we doing? Um, we've entered into a, a partnership with the GLA to regenerate 86 acres of land in East London. We call this East Plus portfolio. Um, and this is really, this is really progressing probably far quicker than we had anticipated. We thought it was going to be a 10-year project. I think it's more likely we'll be out of this in six now. Um, we're building uh, 250,000 square feet in Raynham, so um, some startup units for small business and SMEs, uh, along with the kind of the more classic urban logistics buildings that um, you know, we've got one of these under offer, and we will be speaking to, you know, we are speaking to the retailers, the courier companies, and people like that. Um, so that's currently in, under construction, be ready in October. Um, we have um, Seagrove Park in Ewan, Parking area, Jenkins Lane, we've agreed a deal um, with DPD, so I'm sure you've all had stuff delivered to you from uh, DPD. We have the other half of the site uh, under offer. Um, again, so these are all prelets, so these are deals agreed, and then we'll build the buildings. Um, and so these are kind of that, again, last mile delivery stuff and travel lodge on a small parcel of the site that really wasn't really workable for industrial. So again, it's all good jobs. Um, and and amenities. So yeah, like I say earlier, really, you know, that kind of stuff we could kind of do all day long in those locations. Barking, it's close to London. We could do we could do ten DPDs out there. Um, but we have to think. We have to. We have to think kind of further ahead. We have to keep evolving as a business. We really try and look at the future because you look at people like a, a blockbuster. Uh, Kodak, it's very easy to kind of get left behind and if we don't do this stuff, someone else will. Um, actually, there is, you know, intensification and one of the, the kind of the obvious things is building up and there is already a building in the UK which is two-story, it's developed by Brixton, so which became part of Seagrove, um, which actually found mixed success. So um, it was hit the market in 2009, which I say was a terrible time to hit the market. Um, yeah, and particularly for something that you're trying to convince people to go outside of their norm, when actually there was loads of space on the market at the time. It's actually now fully let. So uh, I'm pleased to say it's close to the airport, so you've got a lot of the, um, the freight companies in there, but it's let, it's working. But yep, there's a few things that we've kind of learned from that that we would, that we would uh, change. And again, this is, I say, this isn't kind of a, a new concept here. Some, um, warehouses that my colleagues in uh, Europe have agreed uh, in Rome, uh, Munich, and Paris. So two of those are actually for Amazon, one for Amazon Fresh. Um, so it, it, it is happening. We've got some plans in the pipeline for Beam Week 6 again in Raynham. So this is a 300,000 square feet on uh, two floors. Uh, and also uh, Meridian Water, something that again we're looking at with um, GLA, it's, it's Edmonton. It is kind of more logistics, but actually it's logistics without taking up too much land. So this is actually uh, 450,000 square feet. And this is really kind of early stages, so this isn't you know, going to be built next week, but this is something we are you know, seriously looking at on a big parcel of land that would be next to residential. This would be 450,000 square feet over four floors, but that's on seven acres. So that would normally be, if you did, a, as I started with, the classic kind of what we would call shed, you're looking at 22 acres of land required to provide that sort of square footage. Um, and again, you can kind of, it, it, it fronts the North Circular, so it can act as a buffer, and actually you can make it a pretty attractive. You know, um, a lot of the warehouses that we're building now, I think Kevin's right, we, you know, we talk about industrial, these aren't industrial buildings that you kind of associate with the old ones pumping smoke out of a chimney. These are, yeah, these are pretty decent buildings now. Nice, um, you know, glass effects and you know, really looking pretty, pretty modern. Uh, this is another one uh, which is in North Acton, um, which is something that we're looking at combining the kind of. Uh, don't want to go down to the word industrial, but the kind of warehouse, last mile delivery type piece on the ground floor 
with residential above and actually making use of that space because we own this at the moment and it's a really good industrial estate. You know, we could we could let buildings on there for ten years, you know, all day long at the moment because it's close to London, it's where people want to be, there's very limited amount of space, they've lost a lot of industrial land for alternative uses, residential. So people want to be, but that's kind of you know, we can't just sit there because ultimately it will just get CPO'd and turned into another resi site. So we've got to look at ways of finding an alternative that we can keep some of our industrial but still provide the, um, the residential that um, the country needs. And is that ideal industrial space? Uh, for me, as a leasing man, no, I'd rather, you know, I would rather have 100,000 square foot shared on 45% density because I can, yeah, I can rest at night. That's good, as you can imagine. Um, and I'm not really an architect, so you could probably like, tell me more, but you need to have uh, kind of a load bearing capacity, so that's going to go through um, pillars, so you're going to have columns inside that warehouse. So yeah, I'm sure the likes of a courier company, a DPD, a DHL can probably live with that, but if you ask them to you know, design a warehouse for you, it probably wouldn't be that. But what we have to look at is have faith in that lack of supply and how we actually make these two things work, because we can't just go on building what we and industrial you know, is kind of one in the dream world. Uh, this is it really from a, um, an, another perspective, but it's all quite exciting stuff really. Um, but that's it, so really what, you know, what I was going to talk about is the loss of land, I said but we, we've covered it, but you know, an interesting fact is between 2010 and 2015 we lost several percent of uh, industrial land in London and it's so obvious that we need that you know we need that because we can't just keep have an ever-growing population and people with this expectation of having stuff and, and being able to go to a restaurant and get food delivered to their house and get other things delivered to their front door without actually having the buildings to be able to um, provide it so really interesting times but I think you know for for us now and the next generation it's kind of getting a little bit more complicated we have to think about how do we make these two things work? Can you have residential and industrial together? Can you intensify the use and have multi-storey? You know, why can't we go down? Well, that's another problem with actually getting rid of the earth that you uh, actually take up. But um, you know, maybe there's a way of finding some other use for that earth that you take up from the basement, so you can go down a little bit. You know, but these are all things that kind of need answers and um, you know. There's always been problems, and there's always a way around them. So, um, yeah, hopefully uh, we can make it all work. Thank you very much. The last speaker is uh, Oliver. Oliver is uh, from uh, We Made That, um, a practice uh, working um, public realm and, and uh, urban scale, urban design strategies. Um, you said. Um, Energetic architecture and urbanism practice with a strong public conscience. And I think I might nick that for our company, actually. <laughs> that, that frames it really nicely. And it's a, it's a practice that, that I greatly respect. So I'm really glad that you're here. And you've been um, working, um, doing a lot of work on industrial land uh, recently. Um, you've uh, studied over a thousand businesses operating from industrial sites, including in Charlton, Riverside, Technowick, and Park Royal. So that Thanks. does qualify you. Good. So everyone's covered everything already. <laughs> so I think I'm going to keep it quite short. So we've got time for questions. I think if that's um, if we're going on to to five. But I think the opportunity really is to talk. It's been quite nice hearing from everyone individually because there's lots of the same sentiments that I'll pick up on. But in some ways, I think I'm going to. I think I have it. But talk from big through to small. Actually, kind of zooming in from a London context down to what that means on the ground for people. And I'll get in talking about Plumstead, which is the kind of town centre, which is immediately south of Nathan Way, where you just about can make your way through over the Ridgeway and through down to Plumstead High Street. And the relationship between not necessarily a site level sense of mix, but the value that industry, places of production have in London for people and that interesting cities are mixed places in lots of sense of the word. I think that's an important thing to talk about, not just from a perspective of industry, jobs and the opportunity for growth in London, but actually about what makes London a place where people want to be and not a kind of dormitory city.
So I should say we made that is an architecture and urbanism practice, but we kind of do a lot of work across several different strands. And I'm going to really focus on the kind of research strand, urban research. But that obviously relates to strategies about how you then kind of master plan strategies about what you can do to strategize about a place and then what that means in terms of delivering built environment, whether that's buildings, public realm or other kind of needs of cities. So <clears throat> starting big. Uh, in 2015, we did, with alongside economists ACOM and Cushman and Wakefield, kind of property consultants, the London Industrial Land Supply and Economy Study. Um, in essence, this looks at the state of industrial land across the whole of London and its relationship to the broader southeast. In some ways, the point of it and the point of our role within that team was to shine a light on something which is ordinarily told through a lot of numbers, a lot of tables, and sometimes they obscure the picture of what it means for the trends of industrial land. So, and when I talk about industrial land, I'm talking about planning, policy, designated and protected employment land. And when we talk today about the kind of loss of employment land, that's really the, the kind of uh, the change from protected employment land to something that could be any number of uses. So this sets out a range of different um, uh, industrial employment land. And we must be some, I guess, Nathan Way is somewhere around here, over there, I think. Um, happy to be corrected yeah. if that's wrong. Um, so in some ways, that picture of what the bigger trends are and how we talk about this, it's been mentioned already. But since 2001, 1,300 hectares of industrial land has been released, i.e. de-designated for use of other things, uh, which basically means 16% change to the amount of supply of hectares of industrial space. And that, as already mentioned, is well-versed, big loss, big impact. Um, but it is also interesting, this pace of release, uh, which again has been mentioned, but the idea that we're losing industrial land at three times the rate that anyone thought we should be. Um, and in some ways, cities are always a blend of mixes and of uses and other things, which is a like nudged over time. The London plan is to 2031. Um, so we're nudging things towards that for the next few years, and there'll be further iterations of that. So that change is kind of cyclical. But it is worth pointing out Greenwich, so Nathan was right here. Greenwich actually, as a borough, is one which hasn't released as much land as it could have against that kind of rate of release. So anywhere where the pink bubble is bigger than the red dotted line is where they really let rip on getting rid of that industrial land. Whereas you can see other places um, haven't been quite so, so uh, emphatic in their release of that industrial land. That's not to say it's not coming, but it is interesting to see the map across London. So that was big. Now to kind of medium. Charlton Riverside, amazing area of industrial employment and heritage uh, just west of uh, the area that this, this brief is looking at. We do a lot of work looking at, and this is a kind of employment study, uh, which is looking at a granular level of what kind of activities are happening in those buildings across quite a significant area of, product, uh, of protected employment land and its relationship to the things around it and the people that operate there. And in some ways this, as Alex already touched on, again, similar methodology, this is going around looking at places in a lot of careful detail and mapping, field work. And I think I'll show a few examples of what takes place within the Charlton Riverside. This is tarmac, this is a concrete batching works um, located because London has a river and that river can be used for stuff. Someone forgot about that over the last kind of 50 or so years, but it still operates in that way. And there's reasons, logistics, I noticed you were kind of A10, A2, A3, fine. But the river is also a really important factor in the movement of goods and services in London. And I don't think it's tended to be used more recently in that last mile or just in time service. It's bringing in significant freight goods into London. But there's that kind of stuff in Charlton Riverside. There's also Sainsbury's. We did Tesco. Sainsbury's, look how high that racking is. Um, so this is actually Sainsbury's supplying 
uh, distribution to its supermarket outlets. Um, but all these things are happening in charge and oversight. And I think, just coming in a bit more with the idea that things are still made in these places, it's not always logistics. This is a company called Based Upon. They do a lot of kind of fabrication for art commission and other things. In this case, they're sort of metal panel work in their panel workshop going on. But those things actually is also that relationship between the things which happen in these big employment centres in our industrial land and the skills and people that are involved and engaged in that stuff. And as we zoom in, kind of once again, this, in this case, this is um, about some products and processes that are made this time. Uh, a piece of work we did called the uh, um, Local Economy Study for the London Legacy Development Corporation. In this case, this is Hackney Wick, which is seeing quite a lot of pressure for housing. Um, and the LLDC have been quite carefully kind of curating through their master planning what kind of uses should take place there or could take place there. In this case, this is a, they make glasses. Uh, these glasses are sold on Savile Row, but made in Hackney Wick. And, uh, this company bought all its machinery in the 1930s from East Germany. It's now over in Hackney Wick. It's amazing, they've got uh, included like, when they built the building, um, they built it with tapered floor plates to let more light into the kind of sunken areas within the building. And these kind of buildings that are, you might pass by and now have a cafe or bar on the bottom, actually are super, super, going back 80, 90 years, were super tailored towards the activities that happen in those. And that machinery has been there since the 1930s, all the way through to now. So the idea of newness is important, but there's also some things about sustaining the, the goods and services that can already happen in good places. And the activity inside the buildings is important, but I was particularly enjoying the kind of stories about networks of places too. We, I mean, refer to them as ecosystems in some ways. The idea that people share facilities, resources, people, kitchens, food, all these other things are really important. In this case, another part of that study for LLDC, looking at um, there was a kind of burgeoning scene around kind of food and drink production. Uh, Truman's, which is an old beer brand, was reinvigorated and re rebirthed um, in the kind of mid 2000s. They share a forklift truck with their neighbours. They also then co-invested in a bottling plant along with Regis and Dobson Cola. So now, instead of one company having to invest a huge amount in a bottling plant, really expensive, they share that cost. But in some ways, the relationship between all those things and the shared forklift becomes really integral to a place. And it's great hearing on Nathan Way that those that same dynamic is super important when you think about how you make propositions for a place and how you tread lightly on those dynamics which are successful both in a kind of economic sense but also in a sense of place and people. So I'm just going to finally touch on the relationship between kind of Nathan Way and Plumstead. So we did an urban framework for uh, Royal Bar of Greenwich. Um, this is going back three or four years but this was at the outset where we were talking about housing zones. So the pressures of housing even in the Miss Walnut area are most significant. That includes Thamesmead, but also includes areas of new housing. This yeah. kind of zone, if I got it right. Yeah. But the relationship, I think, between places of employment, places where people want to live or want to spend time, are super important too. That's homes, that's high street, that's recreation, all the other things that, that make cities tick. It might be that people are buying stuff there, but it's also the things and the fabric of neighbourhoods. And I think what we set out here, just skip back slightly, is the potential to form connections between employment places, places where people are spending time working, and the relationship between new cycle links or town centres full of other activity. And part of the kind of strategy for this place was to look to see how Greenwich as a council, they own a bunch of assets, buildings, and other things within the high street area, can start to use those the things they have available to them to invest in that place and to form the connections and network this town centre, which is quite a small one, to the areas of new housing and intensified or super mixed employment. And importantly, I think, thinking about the things which people want to spend time on or in or doing near place of employment. 
in this case, uh, new kind of uh, community-led workspace, uh, kind of revamped library, new homes, the kind of civic assets make places and neighbourhoods more mixed. So I think when I talk about mix as well, or super mix, it's about those sites, but it's also about the relationship of those sites to the other things that human beings like spending time doing. I think that's important to think about, particularly in the case of Nathan Way, where there is a relationship between a range of activity that we've heard about today outside of just the idea of what industrial land can do and the connection to neighbours, places and people and the activity that take place in all those different areas. So, I'll stop there. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, we have minus three minutes for questions and answers. If, could the speakers uh, come to the front with their chairs, maybe, and just have a seat so that now bring up. This is very nice. It's an image of you. The audience with? <laughs> Uh, no, Alex, the greatest pleasure is just going, <laughs> going there and looking at things, which yeah. is unfair. Um, yeah, I just couldn't say yeah. unfair that I've already done it for you. It doesn't mean that you can't do it again. And, it's, and just entering these doors and putting myself inside is really nice. Any questions for the speakers? Um, considering the decline of the industry around, I just wanted to to everyone, um, whether you would um, see the answer being by design uh, in these kind of pushing forward typologies and densities that you all touched upon, or whether it would be through more policy based initiatives by you from GLA or perhaps a mixture of both. Well, a mixture of both, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, talking from my sort of very small end of the wedge, um, yeah, I can't say that it's. It doesn't seem to me that it, it can be one or the other. It seems to me that it would have to be an extra. So, yes. yeah, going, moving, moving up on in terms of industrial land being lost and the use price being changed to residential, do you think there needs to be a piece of policy that prevents that on such a large scale? Well, I mean, I'd say it has to be both because if you really, as an industrial provider, it'd be really easy to say, just say stop, stop losing industrial land, but it's mm -hmm. obvious that there's a reason we're losing it. Um, and the population is set to increase. There's a massive demand for new homes and pressure for new homes, so you can't really just ignore that. Um, and I think that's really one of the sort of themes is that you know we, we can't just come and kind of moan that we're losing industrial land and we, we want it and we need it because we do. So I think it, ha it has to be a kind of combination of the two, really. I mean, I think policy is absolutely key. But it's not just about drawing up policy. There was policy in place that should have prevented the loss of industrial land at the scale that we had. It was simply ignored, though. Um, and that's, that's problematic, because you can draw up as good a policy as you want if the local authorities don't follow the benchmark release that they have or don't feel under significant enough pressure to, um, as uh, the new London plan will suggest in certain boroughs, like Enfield, for instance, that they should provide new industrial land they don't feel significant or kind of significant enough pressure to actually execute that policy is very irrelevant unfortunately um, so I, I don't have an answer to that necessarily it, it's about there's a culture shift that needs to happen as well I think around uh, how seriously we take industry and I think that point around that uh, we should stop calling it industry is quite it's quite a serious one actually um, when the, by keep calling it by calling it industry and industrial uses it does kind of evoke this image of smokestacks and, and grimy kind of northern cities from, from the 1950s in a way, um, which is so not what most of London's industry is about nowadays. It's about urban services in that, in that very broad sense, and I mean that in the way that it could be logistics, but it could also be the guys making set props for the West End, for instance, uh, or, you know, processing confidential waste from, from office buildings throughout London. It's, it's a huge range of different things. Um, so there is a type, there's a typological question in that as well. But actually, I think that's a, in some ways the simpler one. If we can mix a, a cement factory with residential 
Anything's possible. Anything is possible. I mean, I, I yeah. at two points really. I, I did a piece of work um, that examined what was going on in Hong Kong and Singapore and Tokyo um, in the 70s that allowed them allowed property developers to build multi-storey <coughs> warehousing. And effectively, you've got a checklist of three things. One is an increasing, a quickly increasing population. Two is rapidly increasing land values. And the third is, is militant planning. Um, and you know, in, in the UK, I think we've, we've got two of those things, you know, rapidly increasing population um, and, and increasing land values. And it's only really when you have something enforced mm. um, that then you, you go, well, actually, as a developer, the only option I have left is to go up uh, or, or whatever it might be. The, the second thing is, it's, I'm going to make it, I've been talking about this for about three or four years now, um, it will be a career's work for me to get the property industry to stop using the word shed, um, because um, it's really bad, it's negative, it conjures up bad images of what's going on. Um, I was with, um, I do, I've done a lot of work with uh, an organisation called the UK Warehousing Association, um, and um, their chief executive, yeah, I mean, he puts it quite, quite eloquently, really. You know, some, some warehousing in the UK is actually they're pieces of national infrastructure. You know, they, they service the population, and yet the planning, most, most of the time, is, 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 is decided at parish council level. You know, it's, I, I know that's a generalisation, you know, for, for the purposes of this talk, but um, something needs to change because actually, you know, you have a, a warehouse in the Midlands that is taking goods from China, servicing a population of 10 million people um, with what they need to live, you know, and, and yet we're calling it a, a shed as a kind of a throwaway remark and, and you know, that needs to change. Just add one thing to that. I think it's an interesting um, opportunity in terms of timing, actually. That in some ways, in London, I guess this has been a very London centric conversation, but of course, London's loss might be down to Corridor's game. And there's actually um, further dynamics outside of the kind of London bubble. But timing is interesting because, in some ways, with the land values, with the kind of um, challenges of supply, it means that industrial land, the people are looking at it, talking about it, it's got its swagger back. So in some ways, the, that relationship between policy becomes one where if, as we first day, the market is responding to these things to come with, with its desired solution of the things, the policy, if you like, is there to, to support that. But I think at some point, we have, if we look back 15 years or so, the relationship between industrial land uses on it wasn't as seen as a, as so vital by either the market nor the policy makers. So in some ways that's um, the timing that's now is that the, the, this kind of swagger and interest in doing something. And that's not to be underestimated. Um, I think the, um, you know, the future of, of Nathanway is going to be driven partially by the market, but it's interesting and unusual in that uh, anybody as owners have a social ethos. And that, in a way, lends itself to um, to be more experimental about, about um, the use mixes that we can imagine. And we've seen examples of um, warehouses uh, stacked to the ceiling with goods, and we have seen examples of really small-scale makers. And they seem, um, and it's kind of, it kind of, I guess, um, needs some. It takes some creativity to imagine a place where these goods productively coexist. And in a way, what, what you're doing, uh, the local arts trust, Michael, is, is brief development, isn't it? I, I mean, in the, in the, you're, you're, there's an experimental quality to your, to your, uh, to your ambition that, uh, in a way, tests things and tries things out to prepare new relationships that will form that space. Yeah, but I think uh, in terms of your question as well, I think it's about um, looking at it like an ecosystem and celebrating the complexity. And as an arts organization, that's what, that's what we do. You know, we, we communicate complexity and we celebrate that. Um, and maybe we need to look at 
those communication tools as well for areas such as where your studio is, which you know you, you're doing, you're here. Yeah. But um, the more we push out the narrative, mixed use, um, complex use, be it residential, industrial, um, small scale creative, the more interesting the city is. We know that, we know that. Um, but it's building that capacity um, between developers, which we're trying to do with Notting Hill, um, which is new for them to a degree. Uh, and fortunately, working with people who do get that, you know, really celebrate the scale in which we're trying to um, develop Thamesmead, for instance. But our job in Thamesmead and the docks is to kind of open that conversation and build confidence. Uh, and that's where an arts organization can quite useful. Okay. As opposed to individualized businesses just trying to survive in a way. So the time scale is quite good and long. And we have to insist yeah, on that. Right, yeah. We have to insist on that. You know, these temporary lets just don't work for anyone. And and going forwards, we, you know, Boards and, and um, other organisations have to push that narrative. Otherwise, the gains are never um, seen. And arguably, yeah. sorry, just to, arguably as well, you know, if the social and civic value, which was touched on. Arguably, he's going to need more. Uh, how can I put this? Uh, I guess more intervention. You know, actually, because in terms of in terms of ownership, if you look at you know industrial estates across London, all in myriad ownership, all in um, uh, investors with different time scales in terms of the return that they want to see from that that property. So, so you have a real juxtaposition. Where you know it may be owned by somebody who wants returns in two years, compared to somebody who wants returns in thirty years. You know, if that's a, a, a charity-based type type uh, operation or, or whatever. So then, you know, you need to combine the ownerships, and I guess the only way to do that is 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 via public intervention. Um, question about um, the transport and infrastructure. Uh, in terms of both intensification of different industrial uses and also mixing residential with industrial, how do you see uh, kind of roads and things like this developing? Because obviously, especially with industrial turning more into this logistics network, but then you introduce families with kids, how, how does that kind of play? Well, I, I, I've got a slight diff, slightly different example um, that, that talks about that. So, um, 22 Bishopsgate, which is being built in the city, the um, uh, AXA-funded skyscraper, um, which is the replacement to the Pinnacle, I think it was called. Um, the Section 106 of that development states that it has to have an off-site consolidation centre, i.e., if you're sending anything to that building, uh, that office building, it actually gets delivered to an off-site consolidation centre, which is effectively a warehouse, um, and then that uh, there will then be shuttle uh, runs to that warehouse. That's really clever by the City of London because what that's saying is that actually we can't have the streets of the City of London clogged up with with vans or bikes or whatever it might be delivering to this warehouse. Problem is, um, does that actually make it less? Attractive to tenants. If you're, you know, if I'm office occupier A, um, and I can't get my delivery when I need it, or if I'm, if I'm a worker in that building and I want my Amazon Prime order delivered, well, actually, does that make that that employer less attractive to me? Because actually, I want my product now when I when I want it. Really interesting policy. How it's going to be implemented and how it's going to be, um, uh, how it's going to work, I think is going to be really interesting. Um, going back to your point about residential cohabiting, again, I see no difference to um, uh, supermarkets mm. and um, and residential. You know, the, the Tesco's in Clapham South that's got loads of um, uh, residential above it um, works fine. You know, the, the the traffic flow there is absolutely fine. You're still getting HGVs all the time, vans all the time in a very urban location. So I don't think anything's impossible. I think it. No, go for it. Uh, no, I think. 
You go, Alex. All right, okay. <laughs> I don't think you can make a GLA point anyway. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's also where you start to think about it, which is the point I think I was trying to get at uh, when running through the, the various sort of broad typologies that you might start to look at in terms of intensification and mix. Um, and there's often an immediate jump to the most difficult forms of mix, which is like logistics with housing above it. And that's tricky. That's the, I think we shouldn't kid ourselves that that's something that can be negotiated easily. Um, but there is an opportunity, I think, for, say for instance, at a site, and particularly at, at a sort of master plan, wider area level, we can start to look at sort of say buffers that act as a sort of barrier between larger, more kind of vehicle heavy uses like logistics um, and the kind of smaller manufacturing spaces that are actually, um, in terms of the amounts of servicing they need, relatively modest. No, not maybe occasionally be a delivery in of sort of materials and goods that they need to take, but it's not, not a huge amount. That can be on shared yard space. Um, and then a certain amount of stuff that goes out. I mean, we're, we're all used to now living under, or living above a Tesco Metro or a Sainsbury's local, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's something that is restocked on a daily basis by large HDVs. Again, those are issues that, um, that can be worked around, I think. Um, and so it's not immediately always jumping to the, to the most difficult forms of mix and finding other ways that you might actually uh, bring about intensification and mix within a larger site. I think it's a bigger question too in relation to kind of London's royalties. Um, Mayor, to make your point Alex, if you're <laughs> going to be on message, just released a new transport strategy for North London, for example, in draft consultation now, that the idea, or the idea that the policy promise around air quality is now mm -hmm. in the top five mayoral priorities. How do you balance the need for London to keep ticking and not choke its population. And I think there needs to be some integration between all of those different things. Um, and that, I think that's challenging on a, on a hyper-local, like can the mum cross the street with her pram and her toddler if you've got HGBs in there, right? Can the cyclists get past? All those kind of things are micro-issues. I think there are some broader priorities about what kind of city London could be, and I think the role that industry and making production plays in that city is a really important one. But I think there's also perhaps a balanced set of judgments that need to be taken. And then one last question, maybe, is that, uh, and I have one for Rima as well. And in, 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 you know, what would you like um, Nathan's way to look like in ten years? But I'll give you time to think about it as well. <laughs> um, I guess it's more for Stephen and Kevin, but so. Amazon is basically like a conduit for lots of businesses to sell stuff, but it's being delivered. And I guess if there's this growing pressure to deliver things in a way that doesn't show the city, etc., and to also use space intensively, do you see a way that logistics operators could, in the end, be functioning out the same way, and the last minute, the last minute sort of delivery systems could be sort of a sort of pool of resources in a way where as we work together, just imagine that the pressure is going to be more and more to do these things efficiently. At the moment, I like three pens from eBay and three different plans to deliver it. Same products. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I, if you go further abroad into, into Europe, for example, so the first example of intensification that you put up, um, I remember seeing a presentation in. This must have been over 10 years ago, about what goes on in other jurisdictions in terms of companies sharing space. Um, I think there's a very British thing about not wanting to, to share space or not wanting to do something different. Um, I presented at a event uh, about a year ago and we, everyone in the audience had, had voting pads and I asked a question, um, does your company operate out of multi-storey warehouse space uh, in other parts of the world? 60% of the people responded yes. Um, and it was, all, it was a retail week event, so it was all supply chain directors, um, those type of people, property directors, FDs. Um, would your company, uh, second question, would your company uh, operate out of a multi-storey building in the UK? 80% no. 
Say, why? Why? You, you do it everywhere else in the world. Oh, well, we you know, don't do it here. We never have, we never will. <coughs> Perception and sentiment. Um, real British thing. <laughs> I don't know. You know, um, I don't know if anyone, you know, if anyone else on the panel has a view on that. You know, have I, X2. I'd absolutely agree with that, you know, and I think at the time, you know, we, we put too high a rent in it, I think, at the time as well, because actually it's hard enough convincing um, an occupier to try something different because, you know, um, there's, a, there's a risk around it. Um, and the other thing is asking for a premium for it. You know, it's almost got to be the reverse. So you've almost got to make it really attractive. Mm. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got to balance that against the build cost. So that's a bit of a, um, a, a kind of a situation which you have to uh, try and overcome. Um, and I think also when we talk about X2, as again, you know, this kind of situation in this phenomenon of um, you know, uh, high demand, low supply, is a relatively new thing for the industrial world. You know, this, this guy, um, you know, it's kind of getting your idea, your head around the idea that the sheds is sexy and it's you know, front page stuff, is, is quite new because when, you know, when X2 came to the market, um, <coughs> it was at a time when uh, you know, the economy was great previous to that, no one had any concerns about spec development, so loads of people spec developed, so I'm sure you know, you know, so building a building without a tenant in place on the basis that when it's built, someone will take it. That had happened. So when X2 came to the market, there were alternatives. So if you say to an occupier, would you like to take this building, there'll be someone above you or someone below you, and you've got to get your HGV up this ramp on an icy morning. I'm not going to say that, but they're thinking, <laughs> <laughs> you've got to get this building up this HGV up this ramp on an icy morning, or do you want to take this one, you know, 500 yards down the road? It's the same price. Mm. What do you want to do? That's that's tough, and that's yeah. So we talk about X2. Was X2 a success or a failure? Hit the market at a tough time. It's fully occupied now, and there's tenants working, and they're enjoying it. So it works. But you know, this is a this is a time where we can consider these things because if there are very limited alternatives, people have to get over that. Um, that negative sentiment because Kevin's right, it does exist at the moment. It's it's someone putting their their ass on the line to take something that's out of the ordinary. So why you, you know why would you necessarily do that? Well, you might do it if there's no alternatives. Mm. And because if your alternative is taking somewhere in the right location, a like central as close to London as you can be, or or taking somewhere further out of London, which is a more conventional building. You might have to take that building because you really want space in parking or Park Royal rather than Hurricane. It's the same as you think about your, you know, the decisions you make residentially. You know, do you do you want to live in a flat in Zone One or a house in Zone Six? And you know, people will be making a similar thought process. You know, there's something the give and take you have in the residential market will affect will in time apply in, in this market as well. That's a really good point, really good point. Yeah, do you buy that flat above the Tesco Metro or the two bed house in a nice street that's been there for 50 years? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Prima, you've got an answer? Ten, um, ten, 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 <laughs> make way in 10 years time. I can tell you what I don't want it to look like. Okay, that counts. Which is the new Shoreditch, which I've certainly had, certainly had local authority people talking about. I don't think it ever will be the new Shoreditch, but I think that's just such a mono vision. It's so two dimensional. Um, Thank you very much, everybody. There's a, there's a fresh off the press um, uh, collection, a little thank you. So they've, they've, all, they've all spoken for free, uh, engaged, um, engaged on the topic. Thank you so much, it's appreciated. As a little thank you, there's a booklet here <laughs> yeah. um, of um, Old Kent Road. And, they, um, and there is um, there's also there's a, there's a selection of London produced gin. Hackney, Peckham, and. Peckham is a bit frivolous actually. <laughs> but, um, but this one's from Hackney, it's quite nice. This one looks good. Yeah. <laughs> this from North London, wherever that might be. <laughs> so take your pick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.